Here we go with part two of this week's lecture presentation, History of Communication. To fully understand where we are with online media and to speculate on where we might be going, it's important to look back at where we've been. We'll be reflecting now on the characteristics of electronic mass media and how they're present in online media. As we start, let me repeat a couple of quotes from my previous presentation from the book by Jill Walker Retberg, Blogging. We are moving from a culture dominated by mass media using one-to-many communication to one where participatory media using many-to-many -many communication is becoming the norm. And rather than simply being a form born in opposition to mass media, blogs have aspects in common with many other forms of communication during the last centuries. None of the electronic mass media such as radio, film, television, and then the next stage, the internet, would even exist if it wasn't for one thing, electricity. The power of electricity has been studied since at least as early as the time of the ancient Greeks. There were pioneers who tried to understand and tap its power. The Greek Thales of Miletos, William Gilbert, Benjamin Franklin, Luigi Galvani, and Alessandro Volta, just to name a few. In 1821, Michael Faraday invented the first electric motor. The fans of your laptops, the motors that power film projectors, the factories that make our TVs and mobile devices, the trucks that deliver these gadgets to the stores for us to purchase, all owe a debt of gratitude to Faraday's invention. In 1831, Joseph Henry invented the electric telegraph. Suddenly, messages could be sent at super speed across great distances, faster than horses, faster than wagons, faster than trains or boats. In 1835, Samuel Morse used the telegraph to invent Morse code, and eight years later invented the first long-distance electric telegraph line enabling wired electronic communication to shoot messages back and forth between countries and across continents and oceans. With just some long and short taps, ships in danger could send out SOS messages of distress in the hopes of being rescued. Factions in war could send out instructions to far-off troops. Reporters could send quick updates on breaking news to their editors at different cities. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell patented the electric telephone. The idea had previously existed. Analog telephony carries sound waves. Think of two tin cans and a string. But with electricity, Bell and his team were able to amplify sound and like the telegraph, carry people's voices incredible distances with amazing clarity. Nowadays, digital telephony converts sound waves into digital information, then converts the information into sound waves again on the receiving end. The telephone brought back some aspects of oral communication, but broke the barrier of distance. In 1877, Thomas Edison patented the phonograph seen here in the first picture on the left, which used a wax cylinder as a recording medium for sound. Edison was able to break the barrier of time. Just like writing did for written words, the phonograph did for audible sounds. You could record something and play it right back. In 1887, Emil Berliner perfected this new technology and invented the gramophone, which allowed repeat recording of audio on discs. Those records became a mass medium for distribution, and the pop music industry was born. Now you didn't need to be in a chamber hall in front of a live singer and live musicians to hear their music. You could just play a record, anytime and anywhere with a gramophone. This technology kept getting improved upon, followed by 8-track tapes, audio cassettes, compact discs or CDs, and eventually MP3 files. In 1879, building on the work of others as he often did, but using his genius to fix the flaws that others encountered, such as George Ohm, Nikola Nest Tesla, and Humphrey Davy, 
Thomas Edison invented the first long-lasting practical light bulb. The world was forever changed. The darkness of night no longer hindered people's activities or mobility. And without electric light, you wouldn't have movies, television, computer screens, or touchscreen tablets and smartphones. In 1888, George Eastman patented the Kodak film camera. Images could now be reproduced instead of just painted or drawn. Using natural or artificial light through a lens, images could be recorded on film and printed. In 1891, Thomas Edison again had a brilliant idea, building upon some photography experiments on the persistence of vision that were done by others, in which at about 24 still frames per second, just like the eye blinking, the brain wouldn't see the flicker in between the individual still images, but it would see the illusion of motion. He filed for a patent of a motion picture camera and a few years later introduced a projector using a perforated celluloid reel system developed by his employee, William Dixon. Called a kinetoscope, it allowed motion pictures to be seen one viewer at a time. People would pay to peer at film at a kiosk, witnessing the illusion of motion as figures would dance, run, fight, or do other activities, as if they were right in front of your eyes in person. In 1895, two Frenchmen, the Lumiere brothers, Auguste and Louis, held the first public screenings to which they charged admission of projected motion pictures. They figured, why use a kiosk that only allows one person at a time to view a movie? Why not just project it on a screen and let a room full of people watch? Their projector was imperfect though, the light causing too much heat and often burning the celluloid, the reel snagging on the perforations. It was Thomas Edison again, in 1896, who created an improved vitascope, becoming the first commercially successful motion picture projector in the United States. The movie industry that we know today was born. In 1894, Guglielmo Marconi improved wireless telegraphy. He and others were able to send messages over the air instead of through cables. In 1902, Marconi transmitted the first radio signal across the Atlantic Ocean, from Cornwall to Newfoundland. Thus, Marconi is credited with inventing radio as we know it today. The Radio Act of 1912 limited all private radio communications to what is now the Amplitude Modulation, or AM band, which is medium frequency, which is stronger at night. Public radio broadcasting was marginalized to shortwave frequencies. So the airwaves were public. Space was limited, so regulation was necessary. As an example, if, if you're, when you hear two radio stations overlap as you listen to your car radio on a long drive. Radio became a mass medium and big business. Music, news, entertainment, political speeches, all were transmitted directly into people's homes. In 1927, NBC started two radio networks, Red and Blue, and the CBS radio network began. The Federal Radio Commission established in 1926, and the Radio Act of 1927 regulated the use of the radio spectrum. It became a natural then for images and sound to merge together. In 1927, the Jazz Singer became the first feature-length motion picture with sound. The silent movie era eventually gave way to the talkies. As the performer Al Jolson said to an eager audience in The Jazz Singer, Wait, you ain't heard nothing yet. In 1923, Vladimir Kosma Zwarikin invented the first television cathode ray tube camera. In 1925, John Baer transmitted the first experimental television signal. Just like radio could transmit sound, television could transmit images with sound. In 1927, the first television was broadcast to the public in England. In 1930, television came to the public in the United States. In 1934, Edwin Armstrong built a frequency modulation 
or FM transmitter for RCA. AM radio, which was fine for news and talk radio, suddenly had a better frequency neighbor, FM, which was better suited for music, thanks to its higher fidelity, which meant that more data could be carried over the airwaves, delivering better sound. The Communications Act of 1934 established the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC, which replaced the Federal Radio Commission. The FCC was charged with regulating all non-federal government use of the radio spectrum, including radio and television broadcasting, and all interstate telecommunication, wire, satellite, and cable, as well as all international communication that originates or terminates in the United States. In 1939, Hollywood started producing commercially successful color motion pictures. Media were delivering content that was closer and closer to reality. In the 1940s and 1950s, the big three television networks were born, NBC, CBS, and ABC, and became enormously successful. A fourth early major TV network, Dumont, also sent content over the airwaves until it ceased broadcasting in 1956. 1949 marked the birth of what would become cable television. Community Antenna Television, CATV, delivered programming to households via coaxial cables in areas that did not have strong individual broadcast reception. In 1953, the first color television sets hit the market. The TV set became the centerpiece of many households, just as the radio had been a few short decades prior. In 1954, the National Educational Television, NET, a non-commercial, educational, public television network, begins. In 1959, Xerox introduced the first photocopier machine. Now people could make copies of their own. In effect, becoming their own publishers. In 1965, Sterling Manhattan Cable became the first urban underground cable system in the United States. No telephone poles or microwave antennas necessary. This provided better reception and avoided public airspace for transmission, opening cable TV to less limits and restrictions. In 1970, the Public Broadcasting Service, or PBS, replaced NET. In 1972, Home Box Office, or HBO, began distributing programming on a paid subscription basis. This opened up the debate over public airways versus privately owned cables. HBO wasn't using the so-called free airwaves. The public was choosing to purchase content through HBO just as people were choosing to buy tickets to go see stage plays, concerts, and movies. In 1972, Magnavox Odyssey was introduced as the first home video game console. Later video game consoles included Atari, Sega, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft. In addition to their innovative narratives, video game consoles now also have internet compatibility and deliver other television content too, such as Netflix, Hulu, or Amazon Prime. In 1975, cable TV pioneer HBO became the first television network to continuously deliver signals via satellite, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Eventually, satellite television such as Dish and DirecTV became major competitors of the cable companies for TV content delivery. In 1975, Sony introduced Betamax, a consumer-level analog video cassette magnetic tape recording format that allowed consumers to record whatever they were watching on TV and watch it again at a later time. Rival JVC developed a competing format, VHS, which dominated the marketplace, while Sony battled a court challenge over whether or not using their video cassette recordings for time-shifting viewing was illegal. The Supreme Court voted that it was fair use, giving consumers more control over what they watch. We'll talk more about this when we discuss copyright and intellectual property in a later presentation. In 1979, 
Japan developed the first cellular phone communication network. Those mobile phones were a lot bulkier than today's smartphones, weren't they? In addition to more cable and satellite competition, more broadcast networks emerged. In 1986, the Fox Broadcast TV network debuted. In 1995, the WB and UPN Broadcast TV networks were launched. By 2006, the WB and UPN merged to form the CW Broadcast TV network. In 1999, the first digital video recorders, or DVRs, Replay TV and TiVo, hit the market. This allowed for easier time shifting, the ability to replay live TV, and the power to skip commercials. People were becoming less and less passive in their television viewing habits. By 2010, bundled service for television, telephone, and internet started becoming common. It doesn't seem too far-fetched to imagine all content ev eventually being delivered through one portable wireless device. In our last presentation, we saw that oral communication was mainly one person to one person or one person to few people. Print communication was one to many. Mass electronic communication was one to many, exponentially multiplied. Millions and millions of people were passively receiving broadcasts delivered right to them. The limitations of space and time were broken further than before, but a second orality is born. We can now see people talking even if it was on the screen, even if it was edited. So the need for written symbolism was minimized. The visual and audible seemed to overshadow the written. Mass electronic communication was mostly only one-way communication. We could see only what the broadcasters wanted us to see. With the shift from live broadcasts to primarily recorded broadcasts, there was a sense of permanence and critical analysis, just as in print. In 1972, the first portable personal audio cassette player, the Stereo Belt, was invented in Italy. A few years later, in 1979, Sony developed the popular Walkman in Japan. Now people could carry some of the content they enjoyed listening to with them wherever they went. In 1979, standardized laser discs, optical discs used for storing digital data, hit the market. By 1982, compact discs, or CDs and CD players, became commercially available. In 1995, DVDs digital video discs or digital versatile discs hit the market and quickly replaced video cassettes by consumer choice. Each one of these recording media allowed for more information to be stored and then accessed again. In the 2000s, high definition flat screens and later touch screens became common. High definition and 3D technology are all examples of how media are attempting to make content as immersive as possible so viewers eventually forget the devices that are delivering that content. Now we've reached a modern era of new media. Online media in many ways offers all of the characteristics of the communication styles that preceded. Online media are one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. The limitations of space and time are broken further, but a new print culture is born. Written symbolism returns to prominence with modifications. It frequently offers mostly two-way communication. Its content is flexible and impermanent. There is also the risk of information overload. Changes can be made often very quickly and easily, which has its positive effects and negative effects a new kind of literacy emerges. Let's wrap up this look through history with an overview of the online timeline to see how online media originated. It all started back in 1957. After World War II, during the so-called Cold War between Soviet Russia and America, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR, launched Sputnik, the first artificial Earth satellite. This technological advancement would eventually make satellite television and GPS signaling possible. The United States of America formed the Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, 
later renamed DARPA, to establish an American military lead in science and technology in an effort to counter the perceived Soviet threat. In 1964, John George Kemeny and Thomas Eugene Kurtz at Dartmouth College designed BASIC, the beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code, a high-level computer programming language meant to be easy to use in order to provide computer access for non-science students and non-military types, so academics and soldiers could use computers without needing a PhD to do so. In 1969, ARPANET, the world's first operational packet-switching rather than circuit-switching network, was launched. I'll explain the difference in a moment. ARPANET connected four major U.S. universities, UCLA, Stanford Research Institute, the University of California at Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah. Designed for research, education, and government organizations, it provided a communications network linking the country in the event that a military attack destroyed conventional communication systems. In other words, if Russia nuked one of our cities, we'd have a webbed network through which our information would still travel, safe and secure. Circuit switch networks such as telephone calls require dedicated point-to-point -point connections during communication. Packet switched networks move data in separate small blocks or packets based on the destination address in each packet. When received, the packets are reassembled in the proper sequence to make up the message. It's analog versus digital. Information would now technically be available at all times, even if certain sections are destroyed. We'll talk more about this next week when we discover social networks. In 1971, Ray Tomlinson invented electronic mail or email and also made the decision to use the at symbol to separate the username from the computer name, which later became the domain name. In 1973, work began on the Internet Protocol Suite, later to be called TCP IP, a standard set of communication protocols to allow diverse computer networks to interconnect and communicate with each other. By 1974, Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn first used the term Internet in a paper about Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. In 1975, the Ethernet was developed by Robert Metcalf, allowing coaxial cable to move data incredibly fast. In 1979, Usenet, a decentralized newsgroup network, was created by Steve Belovin. Usenet, the birth of online message boards, was the precursor to social media. In 1979, IBM created BitNet, which stands for Because It's Time Network, a store and forward network used for email and groups using Listserv, an electronic um, mailing list software application. Listserv allowed one-to-many distribution instead of just one-to-one -one or one-to-few. All of that might sound disjointed or overwhelming, but it leads us through the 1970s and 1980s as companies began developing and marketing home personal computers. In 1971, Chemback won. The world's first personal computer was manufactured. See that box that looks like a giant air conditioner or a mini refrigerator? That was the first personal computer. In 1973, Xerox Alto became the first computer to use a mouse, among other innovations. There was no graphical user interface yet, just crude text-based images. No, that's not a desk it's sitting on. That's the actual fully-sized computer. Considering that up until that point, computers were the size of rooms, it was progress. In 1975, Altair 8800 was the first computer to use a single-chip microprocessor. This would lead to faster and faster processing speeds. In 1975, established to develop and sell basic interpreters for the Altair 8800, Microsoft rose to dominate the home computer operating system market with MS-DOS, Microsoft Disk Operating System, in the mid-1980s, followed by the Microsoft Windows line of graphical user interface operating systems. 
1977, the Trinity began to popularize home computers, three brands that started earning market share and convincing people, a few at first but growing, that they needed a computer in their own home. The Trinity included the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and Tandy Corporation's TRS-80. In 1978, Atari 400 and Atari 800 took a stab at the home computer trend. You can see that they were still experimenting, trying to find out what worked. One of them had a flat keyboard. The other tried different recording media to store and access information. In 1979, Texas Instruments TI-99 tried to make a big deal about its color interface. Bill Cosby started the television and print advertisements, again trying to convince the public that everyone needed a computer. It was IBM that convinced the world that computers weren't just important for scientists and schools and homeowners who wanted to use them as word processors and fancy calculators and especially for online message boards and yes for military personnel. But computers were also important for business. In 1981 the IBM PC emerged as the dominant computer inspiring countless PC clones. For years, there would be fierce competition between the open source IBM clones and Apple's proprietary systems. In 1982, the Commodore 64 became the best selling computer of all time. In 1984, the Apple Macintosh became the first successful mouse driven computer with a graphical user interface, revolutionizing home computing. There was no longer any need to know BASIC. The Mac knew it for you. Microsoft soon developed a Windows operating system that would do the same thing for PCs. Apple's famous George Orwell 1984 commercial using symbols of a revolution against Big Brother wasn't just marketing exaggeration. It really was a cultural revolution. In 1983, the University of Wisconsin created the Domain Name System, or DNS. This allowed packets to be directed to a domain name which would be translated by the server database into the corresponding internet protocol or IP number assigning to each computer device. This made it much easier for people to access other servers because they no longer had to remember numbers. Examples of domain names include Fordham.edu, Amazon.com, Facebook.com, NickLeshy.com, Slideshare.net, newyork.gov, nybg.org, and so on, all much easier to remember than a string of seemingly random numbers, which was how people accessed things online before domain names. Internet service providers, or ISPs, emerged to help the masses access this new medium suddenly open to everyone with an internet-connected computer. In 1985, Genie, or General Electric Network, for information exchange launched. In 1989, CompuServe, founded in 1969 as a computer support company, became the first online service to offer internet connectivity. In 1993, America Online, or AOL software, was released for Microsoft Windows. Previous versions for Apple Macintosh were released in 1989 and for DOS in 1991. Positioned by Steve Case as the online service for people unfamiliar with computers, it led to the mainstream embrace of the internet, popularizing chat rooms, email, message boards, instant messaging, and so on. In 1994, Prodigy, which was founded a decade earlier, became the first of the early generation dial-up services to offer access to the World Wide Web and to offer web page hosting to its members. Yes, homeowners could now easily create web pages of their own. Internet service providers or um, ISPs um, weren't able to connect to the internet without the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web was invented by Timothy Berners-Lee. In 1993, Mosaic, the first widely available graphical web browser and the first browser to allow embedded images, was released. 
It's clean, easily understood user interface, reliability, Windows port, and simple installation all contributed to making it the application that opened up the World Wide Web to the general public. In 1995, Mark Andreessen, the leader of the Mosaic team, started his own company and launched Netscape Navigator, which became for a time the most popular web browser. In 1995, also influenced by Mosaic, Microsoft launched its own web browser, Internet Explorer, leveraging it with its best-selling Windows operating system to market dominance. Other web browsers include Firefox, Safari, and Google Chrome, just to name a few. In 1994, blogging was born. Justin Hall created the first recognized online journal, Links.net. In 1997, Jorn Barger be, uh, became the first person to use the term weblog to refer to online journals. In 1999, Peter Merholtz was the first to use the abbreviated word blog as a noun. In 1999, Evan Williams was the first to use the word blog as both a noun and a verb. We're zipping through the years now. It only gets faster and more intense as online media quickly grow and alter the way humans communicate and interact in society. In 1998, Google, an internet search engine company, one of many, launched. It has since grown into a multinational public corporation hosting a number of internet-based services and products. For example, in 2003, Google launched AdSense, matching ads to blog content. Up until then, people created blogs from scratch, but blogging platforms started to emerge, making the act of creating and publishing an online journal extremely easy and inexpensive. In 1998, Open Diary launched, offering online writers free hosting and an easy publishing solution. In 1999, a number of blogging platforms launched, including LiveJournal, Pitas, and Blogger. Blogger would eventually be purchased by Google. In 2003, WordPress launched. A huge development was portability as wired connections gave way to fast wireless delivery of content. In 1999, the wireless technology called 802.11b, more commonly referred to as Wi-Fi, was standardized. Over the years that follow, this technology has appeared as a built-in feature of portable computers and many handheld devices. Net neutrality issues emerged as the debate grows about who controls the means of information distribution since we're back to public airwaves again. But despite the controversies, wireless mobile devices have brought the internet to the palms of everyone's hands, and soon to hands-free devices such as Bluetooth and Google Glass. In 1999, the first BlackBerry smartphone hits the market. Then in 2007, the first iPhone is sold. The birth of Web 2.0 happened in the last decade, when web users became content creators more so than ever before. In 2003, Technorati, a blog search engine, launched, tracking over 150 million blogs. In 2004, Flickr, a photo-sharing website, launched. In 2005, YouTube, a video-sharing website, launched, revolutionizing the global distribution of user-generated video content. People were creating, distributing, and consuming enormous amounts of original content. They didn't always need traditional media anymore. Web 2.0 also saw social network theory brought online. In 2002, Jonathan Abrams and Peter Chin launched Friendster, one of the first mainstream social networks. In 2003, Brad Greenspan and others from Friendster's parent company, eUniverse, launched MySpace, which became for a time the most popular social network site in the United States. In 2004, Mark Zuckerberg and others launched Facebook, which revolutionized the mass media potential for social networks. Facebook currently has more than a billion worldwide active users. In 2006, Twitter, an easy-to-use social networking and microblogging site, was launched. We'll talk more about social networks next week. In 2007, Amazon introduced the Kindle, 
bringing electronic books or e-book readers to mainstream. Its proprietary e-ink technology, non-glare screen, wireless WhisperNet delivery system, lightweight portability, long battery life, and large file storage space made it the market leader. In 2010, 4G wireless networks launched in the United States, allowing for high-speed connections to devices such as cell phones, tablet computers, netbooks, and laptops. In 2010, Apple's iPad revolutionized the tablet computer market. These are the devices that people started using to shop, job hunt, research, and communicate. As I pointed out in my last presentation, through the words of Jill Walker Redberg, the most recent medium, the internet, is increasing the amount of reading and writing people engage in, a form of textual practice. And it all builds upon what came before. For the final paper at the end of the semester, you will explore your own experience as an online writer, and also predict what you think the future of online writing will be. Hopefully, by looking at the past and how we've come to this point, you might be able to better speculate on where we're going and what the future might hold. Will history repeat itself, or will online writing go in directions we can't even begin to imagine yet? See you next time.